exactly two. And I'd like to welcome you to the MBA SBO Business Weekly Series. I'm not sure what series this is now, but I'm sure it should be in the 20 somethings, I think. 20, 23rd. 23rd, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. So welcome to the 23rd in the series. And um, there's just some interesting conversations that we had before now. And we hope that this particular conversation can be as interesting as the previous ones before today. I would like to firstly introduce the topic which we'll be looking at today, just trying to drill down on the legal framework for sexual harassment in Nigeria and what has really changed as to what we had before. And so to help us deal with this, we have um, the only male panelist to drive this conversation, <laughs> Mr. Rudolf Izani. Rudolf Izani is an is an, an academician as well as a practitioner. He is a director of the African Bar Association, Bar Association, one of the biggest bar associations in the world. Um, he's also a resource person at the Pan-African University, Pan-Atlantic University, um, where he where he's um, a key resource person for that institution. Rudolf is um, an advent and very highly regarded litigator and provides also adversary services over time as well. And uh, Rudolph has been known for some very, very groundbreaking decisions as um, at the National Industrial Court. I think we'll have that conversation later around those decisions. And I know he has appealed on so many of them. So we're still waiting on them. Rudolph, uh, welcome. And I hope you'll be able to help us drill down this conversation. Thank you, Osri. I'm very glad to be here. Fantastic. So um, we also have with us Natalia. Uh, well, I forgot to mention that. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> Rudolf is also a publisher and has published um, a particularly good book on thoughts in Nigeria. And um, same way is um, Natalia, who is also a publisher. Her book just came out. She's very, very active in the employment and industrial relations space. And she's done some very, very interesting um, matters around the, the topic for today. She's more of a private sector legal entrepreneur, and uh, we're very glad to have her here. Um, today. Thank you for joining us, um, Natalia. Thank you very much. At GPK Oshodi has um, um, one of the most robust profiles, and it might probably take me um, 10, 15 minutes to read that. So I, I will just try and summarize it. Please pardon me if I miss out a lot of, a lot of stuff that you put in there. But at GPK Oshodi has had extensive experience with the public sector, trying to set up some very innovative um, MDAs for legal state government and running and setting up structures as well there. Uh, she's been very, very influential in that space, but now she's a private practitioner with a master's degree in um, a whole lot of stuff. And we are hoping that she could be able to give us some perspective from the public sector point of view and Natalia from the private sector point of view, while um, Rudolph gives us the perspective from a call litigatory and advisory point of view. So we can then have a well-rounded a robust conversation. So on that note, I'd like to dive right into it. But before I dive into it, I just like to create some, give a bit of perspective. I mean, there's been a lot of talk <clears throat> recently about the concept of sexual harassment. And there's been a lot of stati statistics around, you know, the, 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 how, how, how much of an endemic situation we have in our hands. But I'm not going to go into that. I'm just going to try and trace somewhat a bit of a history of how we got to where we are with sexual harassment. It'll be interesting to note that up until 2010, you will not find the word sexual harassment in any statute in Nigeria. So the first mention of sexual harassment as a concept was actually in 2010 with a third alteration to the 1999 constitution, specifically in section 254C, 1G, where in trying to delineate the jurisdiction of the court, clearly stated that in disputes with respect to discrimination and sexual harassment. That was the first mention of sexual harassment. But the interesting thing was that the constitution did not define what sexual harassment was. But the beauty of the, of the third alteration was that it was a catalyst for a lot of change. So when you then combine 
the National Industrial Court Act of 2006 and the third alteration, a combined reading would mean that National Industrial Court had powers to implement international best practices and also to, to um, produce its own rules of court and order. And in 2017, the National Industrial Court came up with the rules of court, rules of procedure of 2017, which in order 14, why not also define sexual harassment, lay the boundaries and the parameters of what you need to, what you need to prove, what you need to set out when you are filing a claim for sexual harassment. So which could be either a physical unwanted conduct, a verbal yeah, comments, non-verbal comments like exposure, self-exposure, and um, comment generally, and the quid pro quo aspect, which meant that I'm offering you, I'm asking for a sexual favor to give you something in return, either for a promotion or a job or whatever. But prior to that time, with the third alteration also, it meant that we could apply treaties that we had ratified but not domesticated, which was the first time it's ever happened. Typically, under our constitution, if we sign a treaty or convention, for it to be part of our laws, it has to be domesticated. But with that, when it, with respect to employment law issues, then once we sign up to the treaty, ratify the treaty, then it becomes part of our law. So in 1985, we ratified CEDO, which is the Convention Against Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. But because it was never domesticated, we could never use it as part of our laws. But by 2015, the National Industrial Court was now able to apply it, not just as a best practice, but because it has been ratified and it became part of our law. And that was one of the basis of the decision in Madwaka against Microsoft and Israel Limited. And so by 2017, with, with, the, with the rules of procedure, there was something, so, some form of semblance by implication of definition of sexual harassment. Fast forward to 2019, following the outcry of the Me Too movement and, and all, and the IBA survey on sexual harassment in, in the Bar Association, the ILO came up with Convention 190 on violence and harassment in the workplace. This was one piece of legislation I would see as a rule order that more or less encapsulates everything to do with sexual harassment. Interestingly, on the 29th of November, 2022, Nigeria submitted its articles of ratification, meaning that that convention is now part of our laws. However, there's a caveat under the ILO provisions, it becomes effective 12 months after um, submission of ratification. Even if it is not applied today as a law today, it can be applied as a national best practice. So we thought it was important that we have this conversation so that people begin to understand the various stakeholders and the various definitions of, of the, the ambit and scope of that particular piece of legislation, which to my mind has finally extended the meaning of the workplace to include trainings, internships, um, ex-employees, vendors, and anybody that comes to the workplace. And with it, whether the formal or informal sector, whether in the urban or non-urban areas, and for things like social activities related to work, like trainings outside, and even commuting to work. These are spaces where employees could actually bring claims for sexual harassment. Quite apart from the damages, I think reputational damage for organizations and what organizations need to do to make sure they don't find themselves in, in the spot that um, um, Financial Reporting Council found itself or um, um, Microsoft. So on that note, uh, with that little bit of perspective, I would like to then throw the first question to our um, litigator per excellence, Mr. Rudolf Izadi, to and I mean, let me just also make the point that we will take this particular topic in two series. This first series today will drill down on the legal framework. At some other point, we'll have another series to look at redress mechanisms in the shop floor, which is in the, in the organization, and in this public space, which is the National Industrial Court. 
So now that I would like to say, Rudolf, what is your understanding of the new legal framework as created by Convention 190 and where who are the relevant stakeholders under the new regime? Uh, thank you, Jose, for the question. Um, without wasting much time, my, uh, that convention is actually far reaching. I think that's a summary I can give of it. Um, it's far reaching in, in a few respects. So, one, it does not only deal with sexual harassment, it deals with violence and harassment. That is a lot wider than sexual harassment, which is the to topic we're dealing with today, okay? And it defines violence and harassment in employment as all the unacceptable behavior or practices or threats, you know, whether occurring once or repeated, which result in uh, physical, psychological, or economic harm. So it gives a very wide definition. And it also says it includes gender-based violence, okay? And then it goes for that to say that gender-based violence includes sexual harassment. So that's why I say, I say that it's a lot wider. The definition given is much wider than sexual harassment we're dealing with today. So that's one um, aspect. Second is that you mentioned or you, uh, you referred to it in your opening statement or something. We're talking about the scope of the convention. It deals with, it affects not only employees, as we know it traditionally. It affects everybody in the world of work. Now that expression, world of work is key to helping us understand that. And it goes on to say, including whether anybody who is working, whether he's on a contract or not, volunteers, job applicants, job seekers, you know, everybody in that world of workspace. Um, discussing the world of work may, we may require another series, another, <laughs> another <laughs> <laughs> to discuss that, but that is how wide it goes, okay? And then it talks about where and in what areas can you have violence or harassment? Again, it's not only in the place of work. It gives a very wide definition of where this, these things can occur. One, in the place where the employee obviously works. Two, in the place where he is paid or he rests or takes a break or he eats. It can uh, encompass where he uses sanitary uh, facilities or the washroom or, you know, it also includes when he commutes or she commutes to work or, you know, to or from work. So it's a very wide area, okay? So my understanding is that, like I said, is a far reaching convention, um, encompasses not only sexual harassment, but indeed violence and harassment as you can imagine in all these areas whether in the traditional workplace or not. It affects everybody that has anything to do with work. Now, remember that even the ILO tells us that work and employment are not the same. So that's why I say when you talk about, when it talks about it protects people in the world of work, that can require another, uh, another um, intervention for us to discuss that world of work. So it's it's a quite robust, it's quite a robust uh, convention. If I may stop at that. Thank you, thank you, um, um, Rudolph. But before I, I just, before I move over to you, Ajibike, I, I, would, I would like for you to also share more light on commuting. I mean, I found that very, very interesting. So perhaps um, in our client, things like, um, um, car pooling or car sharing are not very popular because organizations have um, uh, what's called staff buses and all that. So, what it then means, I mean, I want you to look at it from that legal point to that point as well to just drill that down. Does it mean that if I 
take someone in my car to work as I would do every day. And there was a, some thing around sexual harassment that that individual, I can sue that individual and the company and they'll be liable in my own private car because we commit to work. Yes, theoretically. In theory, yes. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't limit it to company provided mm, uh, yeah. um, um, uh, commu commu commutes, you know? Yeah. So it could be, and that's why I say the concept of world of work, yeah. work, what we need, I mean, we really need to have a session on that because if, when you appreciate that the world of work is very wide, <laughs> you begin to see that it's not just the uh, your colleague sitting in the next table or the next mm, table yeah. that this thing refers to. Okay, okay. It's not just uh, typically when you think of sexual harassment, you think of uh, balance of power, an employer talking to or, or relating with somebody below the person. If you read that convention carefully, you will find that it's quite possible under that convention for there to be violence and harassment from bottom up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Then I mean, that the, the commit one is something I just wanted you to, to drop on so that people, organizations can understand how, how, how important. Even, even let me help you, uh, Ose. You remember that even in this country, some of these uh, 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 um, car hire, uh, what would I call mm -hmm. it, hire services, even have sharing on the app. Yeah. Can share rides with people going to work or coming from work. So it's not just you, it's not only you in your private car. I mean, you want to help somebody and mm -hmm. you're taking the person down to the office. When you share a vehicle going to the office in the morning or coming back from the office or going somewhere, mm -hmm. you may find that you are in the world of work with that person. Yeah. You may just find that. So that is how wide it is. That commutes to and from work. It's not far away from us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rudy. Um, I keep it over to you now. Yes. I mean, for the for the better part of your career, you've been with the um with the with the government, setting up institutional frameworks for our government and MDEs yeah. as well, um, specifically with legal state. From your experience, what is the attitude of um, governments generally, specifically legal state government? Towards the scourge of sexual harassment. To be honest, I was um, I, I presented the paper at the International Conference on Gender and Sexual Harassment at the University of Nigeria last month, and one of the takeaways from that is um, that the attitude of the public sector in the public sector, because it's very patriarchal and and government is that of um, tokenism when it comes to sexual harassment. I mean, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but having worked in having been a female and having worked in the public sector, what would be your view as to this? Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for that question. I'd like us to know that this the issue of sexual harassment has actually been a recent thing in the last 10 years. And as we know, government is always quite slow to catch up. Throughout my time there, even though they've been sat at disciplinary boards, I've never actually seen anybody go through to the board or write a query claiming that she or he was sexually harassed. Maybe because of the nature of government, as we know, it's also, also so many things there to do with favor. And nobody wants to get, nobody wants to get by the wayside or actually be singled out. So we haven't had a lot of cases of women or indeed men actually writing queries for sexual harassment. Because you know, before you actually write a query, you have to have evidence. And it has to be get submitted to the director of administration in each power state or where you are. In cases, in the few cases where I've seen that where there's been sexual harassment, maybe there's been an in-house attempt to, di to directly speak to the person in charge, either verbally or appeal to them. There's been no case of anything being written down or even a personal management board being constituted to probe the person. As you're a civil servant, if this happens and it becomes unbearable, you have cases of people asking for transfers to another place. 
to another ministry or another department to stop the scourge of sexual harassment. Another thing I want us to note, I don't know if government is actually aware of this convention. Even in our handbooks, because we have handbooks and civil, we have codes of conduct. There's nothing being put specifically for sexual harassment. So it might be a, our, our committee may have to write to the Ministry of Labor and maybe start the change there. As at now, and throughout my 15 years, I never saw anybody being dismissed, anybody being told not to sexually harass his junior or has her junior for that matter. So we too, we have our part to play as a committee to actually inform them and actually let them put it in the code of conduct at national and at state level. When it comes of sexual abuse, like Lagos State is hot. We have the Lagos State um, domestic violence and sexual abuse. So when it comes to outsiders, they're on top. We have our rescue team. <laughs> but inside, because of the prevalence and because mm. of it, it's seen as being even socially acceptable. But to be honest, some bosses, when you now speak to them, they desist. And the lady or the guy, because we have to know that sometimes the woman is the aggressor in, in, in some cases, and it's not the man, or they desist from the sexual harassment. And we've had cases of people having to resign as well. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I you. I think, think we need I'm, to I'm, inform I'm, them and see what goes on. Great. Great. Thank you, Ajibika. And what I get from you is that whereas the government can be very proactive when it's outside, when it's external, when yeah. it comes to looking themselves in the face and saying to themselves, we're also guilty here, it's a difficult task. Yes, it's quite a difficult task. Interesting, interesting perspective. So let me just make the point for our, our, our audience. Please, you can drop in your questions in the chat box and then we'll come to them. Please drop your questions in the chat box, then we'll come to them. Thank you. So over to you, um, Natalie. So same questions I, that I posed to, to Ajibike. So you've been in the private sector in all your years of practice. Um, you've had to delve also into things, concepts around depression and and one of the major causes of depression in the workplace is sexual harassment. So coming from a private sector point of view, what do you think is the attitude of private employers to creating a framework to addressing this issue and implementing same? Okay, um, thank you very much. So um, let me start uh, by saying that uh, in the past, right, um, the attitude was just more like an I don't care attitude. Like, it's like nobody's gonna do anything to me. Now speaking from the employer's point of view or the superior's point of view, nobody's gonna do anything to me. So for them, they want to, they will get away easily with it. And for them, it's all about protecting their image. So once there's an issue of sexual harassment in the past, nobody wants to talk about it. They hush it down and even threaten the person who is reporting the matter. And so for fear of not being, um, victimized, so they just stay away. But over the past um, period of time, that has changed. It's no more business as usual in the private sector. So what happens now is that companies are doing their best to ensure that they put up strict policies to prevent and also deal with cases of sexual harassment. So you find them in, in the company, there are company policies surrounding the issues of um, you know, sexual harassment, what is to be done, um, to prevent it. And so beyond um, doing that, they also um, try as much as possible to put, to carry out trainings, to train the employer and um, to em employees to ensure that these are things you need to know. Because again, some persons who are involved in sexual harassment um, behavior don't even know that those behaviors are actually, um, you know, sexually harass um, sexual harassment related. So what they do basically is to ensure that they train their staff. These are the things you have to do. These are the things you don't have to do. And then now you see companies, they're not so loud, um, ensuring that 
they create an environment where people can report cases of sexual harassment. In some companies, you find out that it's the HR the matter is taken to, to look at it and address it. And it's set up this um, you know, committee. Now, again, it's not so um, come on in that way. They don't make it so loud because again, it's all about the image because for them, they must protect their image. They must project to the world that we are a good company. We are a friendly environment. Our employees can feel safe here. So they give that, they want to protect that image. And then again, there's this financial aspect of it. They also don't want to lose customers. They also want to lose, uh, you know, yeah. Always, <laughs> money is very important, really. So because when money speaks, every other thing is, uh, you know, silent, so to say. So in, in, in the bid to make sure that uh, all this is put in place, companies are now ensuring that policies are being put in place, strict policies, and also making an environment conducive for people to come and report. And the issue of confidentiality, too. They, uh, in, in making these policies, they ensure that, okay, fine, you're going to report cases of sexual harassment. You're doing it in such a way that nobody even knows, except maybe the person who is directly involved. And now they don't escalate it. They don't make it so public. Even some other employees might not even be aware of what is going on, except maybe I confide in a, in a colleague and the person is aware. But what the management does is to actually call them because, again, if someone reports sexual harassment, you want to protect them for embarrassment because, again, you're going to expose that person to ridicule in some way. And then some persons are even afraid because their colleagues look at them as a very bad person. You want to send me away so I don't have a job, come up food for my mouth. Okay, you know, they look for every means to set you up and all of because you have become a threat to them. So that's why it's important. Now we're seeing changes, but a whole lot still needs to be done really. So that's that's been the attitude of the, um, the private sector. And I know again, let me give you an example of a, a particular um, lady who was harassed. And so she was given an option and she said, if you report, we would send you away and we'll have a lot to make sure we embarrass you and you won't get a job anywhere. So it's either you take our offer and quietly resign and everything dies, otherwise you know we'll go. And, and that's where the power imbalance comes in really. So it all depends and it varies. So let me um, stop at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, um, Natalie. I, I mean, just to support what you've said. Um, so the Nigerian Bar Association in the last administration to the Nigerian Women Forum designed a sexual harassment policy for the NBA. I was part of the team that um, designed the implementation guidelines for the policy. And even the current administration took it up as well and was presented at the last AGC. And it's a good to have policy. I mean, why I say this is, I'm just trying to just oppose what you said with um, with um, Ajibike. They don't have that in their policy, but as a public sector, but the MBA, well, more a collection of mostly private lawyers, a lot of private lawyers and law firms, which was talking at law firms, now have a policy as a starting point for sexual harassment, which in itself is a positive thing. And so if the public sector has a policy as well, maybe we can begin to see some common grounds and some, some improvement in, in how, things, how things go. Okay, so um, Rudy, sorry, this is the second question for you. Okay. So we've spoken about the legal framework as it is. Is one thing, but the other thing is how, what do I need to prove to sustain a claim for sexual harassment in national industrial court? What are the elements that I need to prove to sustain a claim? I think it's very important for people to know about this. Yes, I think so too. Um, thank you for that. Um, from Look, a, I need to project a bit more. I'm sorry to hear from you. The, from a review of, the, I said thank you for the question. From a review of the uh, decisions that have come out from the National Industrial Court, and even taking um, from your comments, uh, uh, the concept of, of sexual harassment is quite relatively new. Okay, um, although now 
since 2010, I think we are now in about, uh, we, have, we are 13 years on, so we should be getting familiar with it, okay? But what the courts have done is to um, look at the definition of sexual harassment, particularly from uh, the ILO instruments and the courts, decision of, decisions of courts around the world. And, you know, to say that these, um, uh, and then to define the, the, the concept, sexual harassment from that, and then to go on to find, to weigh whatever material that is be, be, before them against this definition. So for instance, what, what they have said is, look, sexual harassment is unwelcome behavior. That's the first thing, it's unwelcome, okay? Sometimes they say, they use the term unsolicited, but I'd rather use unwelcome because even though there may be solicitation, at some point, they, at, at some <laughs> point they move to unwelcome, okay? So i rather focus on the unwelcome part of it, okay? They, 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 because the two concepts are not interchangeable, un, yeah. un, uh, unsolicited and unwelcome. So I'd rather say, unwelcome behavior, uh, sexually determined unwelcome behavior. So it is a welcome behavior pointing to uh, 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 sexual, um, uh, what's the word now? Sexual, um, sexuality. Yeah, uh, sexual nature, yep. Yeah, sex, uh, of a sexual nature. And is not limited to physical contact. It encompasses anything that conveys a sexual um, interest in the person who is uh, targeted, okay? And is unwelcome by that person. So you need to prove one that is unwelcome. Uh, better if you can prove that it is unsolicited, but I think the more important one is that it's unwelcome. It wasn't what the person wanted. And then, it is sexual in nature or suggesting a sexual um, uh, 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 sexual uh, orientation, okay? And must then yield, lead to damages. So basically three things, unwelcome behavior that is sexual in nature or the, the, what the term they use is sexually determined behavior. That's the term that courts have used, okay? and that leads to damages. Now, damages is not just money because typically when we talk of damages, we tend to look at money alone, but no. Damages that may include loss of an advantage at work, okay? Or the likelihood of loss of such an advantage, but also that may include a psychological harm. In fact, most of the time, that is what happens, psychological harm. Yes, so those three elements, unwelcome behavior, sexual in nature, and leads to um, injury, legal injury, not necessarily physical only, psychological, economic. These are the three basic elements to succeed in a claim for sexual harassment. Interesting. Thank you very much, Rudolf. Um, just to also make the point that on that same day, 29th of May, we also submitted the um, articles of um, ratification of the Occupational Health and Safety Convention. And that convention talks about psychological and physical safety in the workplace. So the employer now has a duty to provide an atmosphere in the world of work, which is psychologically safe and physically safe. So now when we talk about health and safety, you have to look at the psychological element. And so like you already said, that is in the head of damages for itself as it is. Yes. That's, so that's, that's, thank you very much, Rudy. So, um, and sorry, Jose, if you look yeah. at, just a quick uh, add-on. 
if you look yes, at them, uh, re recently, I think it was in 2021 or so, mm. there was a decision from Malawi on this, yeah. uh, in this area. And the judge, you know, made it, you know, hopped on it, particularly this um, emotional, sexual, uh, psychological mm. uh, aspect to the damages, mm. to, to say that that is in fact one of the, you know, uh, foremost effects or injuries that people who suffer sexual harassment, you know, undergo. Okay, and uh, I, I agree. So if if um, anybody that wants to talk about uh, sexual harassment shouldn't just be looking at uh, damages in pockets. You know, we, we have to think about it also in terms of psychological um, injuries. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and thankfully we have Natalia here who deals with um, depression, so she can she can provide advice and um, counseling for people who go through these things. Um, so, as you can for you, I know you've touched on it while you were um, taking the first question, but from your experience in the public sector, what are the factors preventing witnesses or victims from reporting on sexual harassment? Okay. I just go back to the African culture, the culture of obedience, the culture of just stick with it, the culture of just get on with it and bring it back to the, the civil service where people want to spend years there. They want to spend 35 years and retire handsomely. If you now as a woman or as a man start complaining about sexual harassment, you might be tagged somebody who is not playing the game. And that could affect you later on in the line. There's also the issue of shame in our culture. We find, I think, I don't think even up to 30% of rape victims come forward. So sexual harassment in the workplace, also we must look at the economic factor. If you have a job and you have to leave a job, especially a civil service job, which you want to make PS or director, and you have to leave because you complained against your boss, it could have ramifications on where they'll post you to. It can have ramifications on where they, they might abandon you in the civil service. You might not be able to move up or move to a place where you would enjoy the benefits of being in the civil service. So a lot of people just keep quiet. If you can't keep up quiet and get on with it, you might have to leave your job. So culture, shame, also the fact that there are no guidelines. What do I do to prove this? Do I do some videotaping and put myself on social media? That would contribute to the shame. And no here, now we're all attached to our families. We're not just me. My uncle might watch this and say, oh, you've disgraced the family. Just let it go. So, so many things come to play why people do not say anything about sexual harassment in in the ministries. And when it's such in Nigeria, Nigeria now is quite harsh. So if you are just complaining, oh, what did he say? What did he do? Did he beat you? He didn't beat you now, just leave it and move on. Avoid him, don't talk, get on with it. So it's our culture. So we hope this will change and perhaps we must, inform, we must do a session on things that touch government lawyers as well, because they're key to this. It must be a policy, then we know how to, how to move forward, not just the private sector, because there's a significant number of women work in our public sector as well. So those are my comments on that. Wow, interesting. An interesting point you made, and um, thank you for that. So from the cultural point of view, I mean, I would, I would, I would, I would um, come back to everyone on this. So what, if it's not solicited, but my comment is culturally acceptable where I come from. Yeah. And it's of a sexual nature, but it's, it's culturally accepted. Can I be said to be knowingly, you know, delving into sexual harassment when culturally for where I'm from is a fantastic compliment to pay to someone? But in the context of sexual harassment. So we need education as well. Yeah. So, so I mean, the reason why I brought this up was when we're you know, getting on with the um, 
um, MBA implementation guidelines. It was a particular topic we discussed for almost two weeks because we couldn't come to uh, um, our lab the middle ground to say, oh, so we had to actually chalk out that aspect of cultural acceptability. Because what's culturally acceptable for where you are from might not be culturally acceptable to me. And so where do we, where do we strike the balance? So I just wanted to say that because of um, the point you made on, on culture. Okay. Natalie, um, over to you. So same question for you. In the private sector, what are the factors that the many people from that are victims or witnesses reporting on sexual harassment? Okay, thank you very much. Um, GBK already touched some of those things, but I'll just add that for, for me to um, be able to open up to you and tell you that um, there's an issue of sexual harassment or someone is sexually harassing me, then I must come to the, I mean, I should be able to trust you. So if I don't trust the company, if I don't trust the management, I can't open up to you. That's the reality. There must be trust. So it's lack of trust that, you know, prevents people from, you know, coming out to say, I've been sexually harassed or somebody is doing this to me. And then that's one. Another one is, if is the process, I mean, if I if I confide in you, if I come out openly, do you, uh, would you okay. keep it confidential? You know, some people don't know that you need to keep some things private. Once someone tells you something, you, you begin to share it, talk to people about it. And so one person would definitely say it to the hearing of the person who, um, you know, reported this matter. So where there's no trust, where there's no confidentiality, then, I can't you know, open up to you. Beyond trusting and beyond the confidentiality, what about implementation? If I, if I report to you, what would you do about it? Are you gonna say just like DBK said, uh, did we hurt you? What happened to you? Leave that matter that you worry too much or a caution that says, forget that thing. There are other things to, to bother yourself about. So if I don't see um, any reason uh, to show me that you're going to address it and on time too, then I won't open up. I'd rather take what I'm going through outside someone else because reporting to you is one thing, you doing something about it is another thing and also doing it on time as well so that it's addressed. Otherwise, I can't open up to you. So this is the part I want to contribute because GBK already touched about the, the aspect of culture and I don't want to go you know, into it as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Natalia. Um, I, I think there are some questions here I would like for us to deal with. So the first one here says, can you relate it to remote work that is becoming more prevalent now? Would this apply? Would, um, would this apply to harassment yeah, done virtually? So we don't, we don't take a yes, bite on that. Since you did talk yes, I would, I would like to, definitely, definitely, definitely. I mean, um, even in, even 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 um, in the days where, when most of us or everybody was at work physically, if you go through the sexual harassment cases, you will find that some of the sexual harassment was done it was through the, um, uh, the cyber sphere, via emails, via pictures were sent over the computer and things were like that. So my point is that even then, it was easy to hold somebody to sexual harassment done over the telephone or done over the computers. How much more now, when you're talking about remote work, you are more dependent on the telephone. You are more dependent on your computers. So people sending pornography or sending unwanted or unsolicited messages to people definitely will be will be covered or are covered by this um, by the convention and by the law on sexual harassment yeah um, i mean just to also point out that prior to this time the employee Compensation act of 2010 had actually expanded the concept of the workplace to mean that anywhere where the employer agrees that the employee can carry out his or her duties. So if it's by agreement that you can work remotely or virtually, then you're at work. And then um, somebody stalks you or sexually harasses you virtually, then definitely 
that would apply. And I agree with you, Rodolfo. Definitely, that would apply. Um, I don't know, um, Mark. Did you want to add anything to that? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, um, like both of you rightly said, anywhere, even if it's in the cloud, it's once it's the place where you walk, you definitely would have to report that if it occurs. Because I give an instance, there are some persons they feel okay. They could talk to you. You choose to be quiet. You don't say anything about it because if you stay away, because if you feel by keeping quiet, this person will understand I'm not interested. But you need to make a definite um, you know, statement that I'm not interested in this. So imagine someone sends you a message, make an image. So you assume it's work related and you click. What do you see? The person's private parts. I mean, it's gonna be very embarrassing. Or it could even be in, in a place of work with someone, even though um, you're not using the person's system, but you, you share, let's say you share um, a system together where two people are using the same laptop or computer. And then you, you come to log in to check something. And the first thing that pops out is you know, a new picture, not directly, not directly to you, but this person using the, company, uh, the company's um, you know, um, computer to do some very sh shady things, something very um, embarrassing sexually. Let me put it that way, since you're talking about sexual harassment. So, you know, in that kind of situation as well, it's something that you need to report. So it can, it can take any form and it can come from anywhere. That's just my contribution. Thank you. Thanks. Um, um, Ajibike, would you want to um, say anything that, with, with respect to that? I just wondered, would you advise the victim in this case to start gathering evidence, gathering evidence of sexual harassment? Could that be used? Because if you're a victim and you're passive, and the thing keeps on occurring and occurring where you could you have some videos or some evidence or some, it's very, documentation must be quite important in such an instance. If it happens over <laughs> years or months, how does the victim prepare herself for this or herself? That's what I was just wondering. Yes, I can, if I may come in there. You know, yeah, like in all cases, evidence is the facts are the, are the foundation of the law. So you have to prove that there was sexual harassment. And definitely the person has to gather um, the evidence. Like the evidence. And that's what you're going to take to court to prove that such and such a thing happened. Well, and such and such a person. Okay, thank you. That, that, that's another question. It is a scenario-based question. So the question goes thoughts. What happens to a HR manager who is falsely accused of sexual harassment for her to resign for her mental health? Can she sue the company owner for mental distress as she feels victimized? That's an interesting one. Well, you know, if if I want to be strict, I'll say this is not a sexual harassment question. <laughs> ah. <laughs> it's related to sexual harassment or connected. Yeah, because I say it's, it's related not, or connected. It's, it's related because it's been raised here, you know. But yeah, I mean, if anybody who has suffered legal injury is entitled to claim redress for the legal injury suffered. Okay, so if um, the HR manager, whoever it is, has suffered um, mental distress or psychological, you know, trauma or whatever else, and had to resign, maybe there's a claim. It may even have been a case of constructive dismissal. Yeah, 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 um, and 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 very interestingly, as long as it's not victimization, it's it's quite it's quite an interesting one because the employer can actually be genuinely under the um, supposition that there was, based on investigation, there was sexual harassment. In that case, would the employer choose not to do anything? So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one. And I think it would depend on the fact of the particular matter and not a so generic thing like, like it's been put out here, but it would depend on the fact of each individual case and it would be dealt on that on those basis. Okay, there's another question here. 
So somebody said, does this affect landlord and tenant? Does <laughs> what affect landlord? Sexual harassment? Yes. <laughs> well, um, you know, would we, I think I will approach this question by talking about, by, by, by in this way. Uh, mm. Landlord and tenants in the world of work, are they in that relationship of, you know, work? Now, remember that I said, if we are talking about the convention, mm. Convention number 190. Yeah. It's lots wider. It does, it's not talking about sexual harassment. It's talking about mm. violence and harassment. Okay. Screech um maybe wide enough to cover landlord and maybe wide enough to cover landlord and tenants. Okay. But if um one second, if um if uh we are not able to put the landlord and the tenant in the, in the work relationship, okay? Mm. And it may be difficult to say uh, sexual harassment in, 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 in the workplace or sexual harassment in employment. There may be sexual harassment in other areas. Remember, mm. there may be sexual harassment. You hear, the, you get this in the news, father, child, mother, mm -hmm. mother. All those things are also sexual harassment. But <laughs> what we are talking about, we are focused on here is sexual harassment that is related to the work environment. Mm. Exactly. So of course, the landlord and tenant, landlord can sexually molest a tenant or vice versa, or harass a tenant, vice versa. But if, if what we are focused on is work, mm. it relates to work, then you know, that's the distinction I'm trying to make. Otherwise, definitely, sexual harassment can occur in other spheres, in other, other situations, other scenarios. You know, like I just mentioned, you hear people talking about father molesting daughter, son molesting uh, sister, or molesting mother, and all of those things. Those are also se sexual harassment. Using the using the term in a wide way, in a wide sense. Anyway. Okay. Uh, so I would like to say something. If uh, the only man that is blessed among women on this panel is is done. Mm. <laughs> so I don't know if he's done, and if he's done, I would like to say something in that regard, landlord and tenant aspect of it. Okay, go so, on, please. Because I was just going to say that. What if the landlord is actually the employer of the tenant? Exactly. That was the angle I'm coming to. <laughs> exactly. So the landlord, like some companies, um, uh, we have, you know, residents where their employees mm -hmm. stay, and somebody's put in charge. It could come from that angle, and it's work related. You know. So mm -hmm. what then happens? Um, even if you are going outside uh, of workplace, for instance, what if the landlord, uh, the, the, the the tenancy um, relationship is one of um, a couple of organization. Let's say I, I have a company and the landlord maybe in some cases live above uh, my company. My company is downstairs, the landlord is living upstairs. So we are sharing um, you know, the compound together. And unfortunately, I'm unable to pay my salary, uh, my, my rent, and I'm begging the landlord for some time. And say, please give me you know, some time to pay. And he says, okay, you have options. I can let go of your, your, your rent if you do this uh, to me. Uh, I don't know if that would um, suffice if you are stretching it. I'm asking the only man that's blessed among women in this panel. Can we see from that angle as well, Starida? Oh, okay. Well, um, what I will say straight up is that even this convention that we are, like the focal point of our discussion today, one of the areas it specifically mentions is that, is the, is the point you made that if, the um, anybody living in accommodation provided by the employer. Mm. Okay, if you look at the article three, it says that anything that arises from work and then goes on to list specific uh, scenarios. And one of those scenarios that he mentions is 
where the person stays in accommodation that has been provided by the, by, his, by the employer. So now the interesting thing when I read that is not just if the accommodation is you know, where the person lives with his family or you know, where he lives for two or three years. How about a hotel? You're, you go up on a tour and yeah. your employer pays for your hotel yeah. accommodation. Traveling. That not accommodation provided by your employer. There has been a case where sexual harassment in Nigeria occurred in such situations. Yeah, that's your matter. Yes. That's your matter. Federal yeah. Political Council of Nigeria. Yeah. Uh, President so, Sabimbola, yeah. So that's 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 very well covered. Yeah, yeah. So so okay. I would like us to move to the next question. A couple of questions and comments here. I don't even think we have time to take all of them, but let's just see as much as we can do. So, um, so I, something just occurred to me again, thinking about that, because the scope of the convention covers apprenticeships. Yes. So, if yes. And in the formal and informal sector. <laughs> so, if your your brother in Alaba that's why has some mm. people who who are apprenticed under him, yeah. and because he gives them a room to sleep, there could be sexual harassment from that angle. Yes. Yes. Well, so okay, I just I just thought I should I should mention that. Yes. yes okay. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So this question is: Could we reiterate and itemize the legal basis of sexual harassment in Nigeria, covering national, subnational, and private sectors? No, please come again. Would we reiterate and itemize the legal basis of sexual harassment in Nigeria, covering national, subnational, and private sectors? Well, I thought we had done that all to the beginning. So yeah. <laughs> exactly. Now I'm I'm even trying to see um, if I understand the question, you know, very clearly. Is he asking for the legal framework of yes, and to and to identify which law is by yeah. who? Yes, by yes. Law. Okay. Well, okay. Let me let me attempt it this way. Um, you know that the Supreme Court has given a framework for, uh, you know, the laws enforced in Nigeria in several decisions. Mm. One of the most recent, Abacha versus Fawe in 2000, mm. okay? Um, so it gives the framework, if I, if I summarize it first, on the hierarchy is the constitution. Mm -hmm. Then you have the, um, the uh, international the treaties, and then the statutes, and then the laws of the states, and then the bylaws. So, if we take that as um, as the hierarchy, the constitution we are talking about section two five four one G, which we already spoke about at the very yeah. beginning, where specifically, which was the first place sexual harassment was. You know, specifically mentioned in our laws. So that there it's at the top. Then you have treaties and conventions. The one we are discussing now is one of it, section uh convention number one ninth. Okay. You also have other conventions, CEDO, convention against uh, for elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. You also have uh um Convention uh, one one human rights charter. Yes, African and no, even the African and Human Rights Charter um, will be. I will put it under statutes because okay, because the even though it has yeah. international flavor, because mm. it came into force by a statute of the federal government. Yeah, yeah you know, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights yeah. Enforcement and Ratification Act. Mm. Okay, and then for state laws. Um, I know Lagos State has tried to criminalize sexual harassment in its criminal code, in the latest criminal code. Now, um, it's open for debate. One of the issues that you may have there is whether that is valid, seeing that labor and employment is in the exclusive legislative list, okay? Vis-a-vis um, -vis the definition they've given to sexual harassment in that mm. criminal code. Then 
you come to bylaws. Well, uh, none of the bylaws, I can't mention, I can't remember any bylaws off the cuff, but I'm sure, you know, not just the local government, the universities particularly have laws that are made by the by the Senate of the universities, you know, and um, all these uh, will govern. So that would be the, you know, the hierarchy and you know, uh, example of laws that fit into each of the PG holes. Okay, so I've mentioned the constitution, international treaties, the statutes, the laws by the states, and then uh, uh, bylaws. So I hope that helps to- Yeah. Yeah, that 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 does that. And um, there's some element of sexual harassment um, provisions in violence against persons act of the various ah, states. Yes, yes. I do know yeah. that about um, at last count, 31 states have domesticated it. But but as always, is wanting to domesticate. But I think the only state that is actively implementing is legal state. Yeah, because we already had a framework room before that. Act was domesticated. Mm -hmm. so, uh, then that. there's another question. Um, it says, what happens when your boss sends you money as gift and you later realize there was a sexual motive behind it? The boss later starts to abuse you via email and all can, and all. Can you win a case for harassment seeing that you were always acknowledging the cash gift? Can it be said that you consider to it? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I think I'll I, I think I'll let somebody else start. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay, let me let me go first. So my, my question is: At what point did you realize it was a, there was a sexual motive behind it? So what would make your boss, um, you know, send money to you? Right, you need to understand that. Because again, when we, when we talk about sexual harassment, the first thing that comes to our mind is it's women that's being sexually harassed. But the truth is that men are also being sexually harassed by women. Mm -hmm. I know some of my friends who um, have, you know, had to resign because their boss was a female, kept harassing them, asking them for sex. And these guys have to resign because they didn't want to be associated with that. There's a lot that comes out of it. So the question is, it's not, we shouldn't actually limit to the, to, to the male bosses alone. We should also look at the female bosses. But bringing it to this question, what's the reason behind the boss giving money? Is the money being given to all of you or some of you? So what's your attitude when you, you would know when he sends the money, you want to ask, uh, sir, is this a bonus? Uh, how does it, <laughs> yeah, it's, impo it's important. And then you start to find out from your other colleagues if, they got such gifts. That's where you present, nobody will suspect. And if, if you don't want to be maybe out of home training, you don't want to be rude to your boss, you can you know find a way to return. I appreciate this, sir, uh, but I don't think I need it. But if you say, oh, don't worry, don't worry, just keep it. Then keep it. If it comes again, try and return it. Find a way around it. But if you keep enjoying it, looking good, buying the latest gold, this right, watch, right. and showing off, a girl go ask for something now and you must drop. That's just the reality. But and you have to find out when did it become, when did you notice the sexual motive? If you notice that, then please, by all means, um, send it back. And I'm sure the, 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 um, the company's policy would definitely have um, ways of which you can actually go about this. Maybe the HR or maybe JVK who has been in the industry can say it. You know, how you I don't know, as you said, it could be a very subtle way. I know these things, when sexual harassment happens, it doesn't happen at once. It starts a little by little, and it's important you are aware. And as Natalie said, if you keep on accepting the gifts, it's almost like an invitation to treat. <laughs> I suppose employees too should be aware. Also, it goes back to HR. Because I find that in some organizations, some people are giving preferential treatment, not knowing it's going to land them this way. Before you know they're traveling, they're being given money gifts. So it's important to actually go to a child and actually break the ice. Once you have a code of secrecy between two individuals, anything can happen. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank Sometimes you very, very much. Subtle. Thank you very much. Um, the last one here is actually a comment from Richmond. Um, I just wanted to read that out. 
Um, exactly, it is somewhat a huge task for the person harassed to gather such evidence, especially where there were no written communication from the harasser. It's important to note that sexual harassment could take the form of gestures. While it is important for the person harassed to have evidence, it also is a challenge gathering such evidence. And on the other hand, having evidence is important in preventing wrongful acquisition of sexual harassment. Yeah, that's a good way to capture it, Richmond. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I think we've, we have overstayed our welcome. So at this point, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who for being here, for those that attended and for staying all through. Um, our panelists, thank you very, very much. We shall call on you again when we start with the second part of the series. And it's been a very, very um, interesting and engaging conversation. But if I would just um, beg for five additional minutes for each of you to kind of close out using one minute to perhaps tell us what we need to do more to, to drive the conversation further. Starting with you, the only man among women. <laughs> okay, um, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I'll say that, uh, like we talked about in the beginning, th this is relatively new concept. Um, there needs to be a lot of uh, training, a lot of awareness created uh, for employers and for employees and everybody who is in the world of work. Um, we need to realize because we've, um, to realize that the labor and employment space uh, jurisprudence in Nigeria has changed sig significantly since 2006. And like we mentioned in this um, session, this particular convention talks about or looks to so many people, volunteers, apprentices, job applicants, job seekers, everybody, so many people who are concerned, people who are not even on contract. So there needs to be a lot of training, a lot of sensitization, a lot of information pushed out to all these people about what should be or what should not be as we engage with you know, each of these stakeholders. And that is what I would like to um, urge each of us who has uh, participated to take away, educate, train, seek information, become more knowledgeable about this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Natalie, last word from you. Yeah, um, so um, like I said, educate the people, put measures in place, strict policies, and the policies must be very specific and it should cover you know, how um, the employee can report those matters and the mechanisms set in place. It will be very clear, make it very clear so that everybody's aware and can, you know, and then create a culture where people can actually report and then do something about it beyond just the reporting act, and then give support to the person. If the person requires counseling, you know, offer that service to them. It's important because if the worker is not psychologically balanced, they can't function well. And if they can't function well, it affects productivity. And if it affects productivity, it affects finances. And you know, money answers all things. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think the last words from you. Yeah, last word. I think we should break the shame over sexual harassment. There's a lot of shame. The, the, the victim is always put to shame. She's left hand and dry. It could happen to anyone. And I beg to differ some victims of sexual harassment, as Natalie said. And there's a new thing in Nigeria now. Now it could be male or male. So we should, uh, we should equip our youth from university how to deal with it break the shame and also make sure that there's a path in the handbook, there's a procedure that is followed. Also, it must be confidential. So the victim also has some, is able to trust the process as Natalie said. So I think we should break the shame to all these things because it happens and we're in 2023 and it's becoming more commonplace to everybody now. Break the shame. Thank you. Thank you. And I mean, there are a couple of, questions here and this is one of my right questions. I get asked this question every time I speak on sexual harassment on the cultural aspects and differences. 
And somebody said to me, says the question here, cultural issues, how come it's seen as sexual harassment to see how is your night in climes like UK and it's taken as normal in Nigeria? And the clear answer to me, the, the, the very simple answer to me, you need to go to the anthropology of that word, how was your night? So if you were in the hospital and you were ill, the doctor will probably come in the morning and say to you, how was your night? That's the context in which how was your night is used. But if you take it outside the context of the hospital and ask a lady or a lady ask a man, how was your night? Then you want graphic details of what he did at night with whoever. And that is verbal sexual harassment. But again, culturally, because culturally in Nigeria, we accept it, nobody complains about it. Yes, it might be seen as the norm, but if a Briton or American was here and used that for the person once, and they say, oh, hold on, don't do that. I try it again thinking, oh, it's acceptable in my culture. And you try it again, then there's a basis for sexual harassment because for him, asking such sexual innuendo questions, innuendo questions, is sexual harassment. So that's 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 my my take. Then there's this last question. I think that's the last one we can take. I know um well, time has far gone out, far exceeded our time. But does an employer have a right to assess the situation and determine that sexual harassment has not occurred? What advice do you have for employers in situations that may not be so clear for cases of harassment? So he's saying, does the employer have a right to determine whether sexual harassment has occurred? Yes. Well, um, <laughs> as, as, as far as the employer is not, is not a court, um, that, that may, he may not have the, 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 the capacity, it may not be proper for him to determine that. Okay, that's the question for the courts uh, because you are talking about the rights or duties of people. But mm. like we have said, the employer has a duty to provide a good environment for work that is devoid of sexual harassment. So um, he's he should focus on providing that environment, not on determining whether Mr. A has sexually harassed Mr. B. Mm. You know, putting himself as the umpire, final umpire for that. Okay. Just like we say, um, the employer cannot determine that somebody is guilty of a crime when the courts have not said so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, that, that would be my reaction to, to, to that question. Okay. okay. But again, um, under the convention, there's an obligation on employers to have in place sexual harassment policies, yes. an internal redress mechanism mm -hmm. or remedy mechanism. Mm -hmm. so, so what I would want to believe is that part of the policy you have in place is that you have to have a disciplinary because part of the policy means you must have a whistleblowing policy so someone can report. And then there's a follow-up in terms of um, investigation and disciplinary hearing and if you recall, part of the reason why the court awarded 70 million against Microsoft was the fact that Microsoft did not follow its own internal investigation and disciplinary process. Mm -hmm. So I think employers will have to follow that process as a startup. Because if you then go to, if, if um, there's a case that's taken to National Industrial Court, the first thing they will ask is, did you report this internally? What was done? So I don't think it's whether they were right or not, but it's big. I think it's more of a process thing that you follow the right process um, in dealing with this investigator, this and carried out a disciplinary. You can't get it right all the time. And some circumstances might be so blurred that it might be difficult to ascertain whether there was, and some might be very clear. So I think that's, it depends on the circumstances of each case. To, sorry to cut you. Yeah, and you play by the ear. That's why I said he would. It's better, best for the employer to focus on putting the policy in place to creating the yeah. environment. That's what I mean. Yeah. As yeah. against, you know, sitting in the chair to say this is 
A or this yeah. is not A yeah. and everything yeah. ending there. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for taking your time uh, to you. be with us today. And I've enjoyed myself, and I'm sure um, most of the delegates have enjoyed themselves because everyone is still out there. But if you have any questions that have not been answered, please send it to the administrator endurance. He will forward, forward it to our committee and would we'll take time to answer the questions and send them to you. Thank you very much for your time today. And um, Chairman, thank you very much for being with us all through. Natalie, thank you very much. Ajibuke, thank you very much. Rudolf, thank you very much. Usel thank, thank, thank you very much too. <laughs> Yes, you have to thank yourself. On that note, I'd like to say thank you, guys, and do have a pleasant day ahead. You too. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. bye. bye.